finally back home. So it's good to see you from here. And I want to also greet everybody who was patient enough to wait while I was late. So I apologize again to everybody here. So we welcome you. It's good to be here for Wednesday in the Word. Are you ready to get into the Word? Yeah. Okay. The Word of the Lord is the gift that God has given us to transform us and cause us to grow. And as we grow in the Word of God, we are becoming more like Him. So would you look at somebody and say, I'm becoming like Jesus. Okay, that's good. Let's try it one more time. <laughs> yeah, y'all might be tired. I'm exhausted. So we're going to do this together. I'm becoming more like Jesus. There we go. The goal of salvation, the reason that Jesus died for us is not just so that we could be saved from hell, but the Bible says that we might become sons of God. So he's transforming us into his image. Every single day, you're looking more like him. Every single day, you're becoming more like him. You are being changed into the image of Christ. So what that really means is he dwells in you richly. So I know we're going to talk together tonight. I'm, I'm noticing this more and more. The more I'm teaching, the more I realize when somebody says something, they remember it. So would you do this? Just put your hand on your chest. And say, I am, I am carrying, carrying Jesus, Jesus, and he's changing me. Ah, he's changing me. Now, you have to remind yourself of that because there will be days when you don't feel like you're changing. There will be days and moments when you don't feel like it's producing in you, that this glorious salvation is producing peace and life and transformation and glory. And you will have the desire, you will have the mindset, you will have the emotional breakout to accuse your own self of not growing. And that's when you have to remember you're not changing you. He is changing you. And sometimes in the midst of the transformation, your emotions are louder than your spirit. That's why we have to go back to the word. So, let's talk about it together. If you would go to your Bible, Acts 2, 42. Acts 2, 42. Oh, we're going to dig into the Word. The Word of God works if you work the Word. Now, I've been saying that for years. I'm going back to it because I'm realizing, even in the midst of some of my travels lately, I'm realizing as I go city to city and place to place because there was so so much time when I wasn't traveling and I was here and studying and working, now that I'm back on this travel schedule, I'm realizing the thing that's stopping people from growing is they don't know how to study the word and then apply the word. The thing that's happening more and more in churches and in conferences and in people's life is we have what I call a flood of voices. Now, there's a flood of voices in the world right now. Everywhere you look, somebody's talking. Everywhere you check, whether it's YouTube or Instagram or you go on the Internet and look, you can pull up any number of teachings over the last 40, 50 years. We can go back to old teaching, old conferences, new voices that are out there, and everybody has an opinion. Now, the problem with studying all these voices is if they didn't have a real life in God, you're listening to someone's opinion that may not be rooted in God. This is important. And if there is no power of God on their life to bring transformation, then you're listening to someone who was studying somebody else, but they had no victory themselves. So number one, make sure if you're listening to people, is their history in God good? What do I mean by that? Did you even check to see, did this person actually produce anything in God? Or did you just travel through YouTube and find somebody saying something you wanted to hear? This is important. Did you research to find somebody that was preaching a word that you already wanted to find agreement with? 
Or did you dig into the word and find out that the word doesn't always agree with your opinion? So you need people who are teaching and preaching truth even when you don't like it. Ooh, we just a little quiet then. That's a, woo. Okay, I'm glad I got the Holy Ghost. He'll amen from the inside if don't nobody say nothing on the outside. So, <laughs> because sometimes what we realize is in the midst of life, what God is doing is as he's growing us, he's confronting the things we may agree with on the deep place of our heart that we didn't even know weren't right. Have you ever had God show up in your life and he starts touching something on the inside of you that you didn't want anybody to know about? Whether it's that, you know, we, you might have an issue with trusting people or you might still have an anger issue or, or, or you might love people, but you just stingy. You ain't going to give nobody a dollar to save your life. You just, woo! And the Lord keeps nudging you every time you go by somebody in need, bless them. And now you've gotten to the place where you'll pray about them as you walk them past, but you're not pulling no dollar out there walking. Mm -mm. For some of us, what it's coming down to is you've walked with God long enough, but the problem you're having is you are still wounded. And your wound speaks. And so now, whether it's in your marriage or towards your kids or to friends at work, you're putting your pain on them. You're projecting your issue. And now God wants to use you to heal and restore and release the kingdom. And you're not able to extend it because out of your own pain, you can't trust people. You can't walk with people. And now we're in the hour where God says, if I can't go after that hidden pain, I can't transform you fully into my image. Why? Because Jesus was free from the wounds and the offenses of the heart. The power of God, the kingdom of God, is not about how many healings you can have when you lay hands, not about how many folks will fall out when you pray for them, not about how many souls you can get saved. That is God working through you. The kingdom of God, the salvation is supposed to produce in you a level of maturity where the old you stops showing up. So what the fullness of the kingdom about is not about what the gifts can do through you, but about what Christ produces in you. So at the end of the day, there should come a moment in your life in God, in your walk with God, when you look in the mirror and don't see the old you. For you have been buried with him in baptism. Ah, there should come a moment when you have seen the old you go down in salvation, died in baptism, wrapped up in the spirit of God, drowned in the glory of God. And the Holy Ghost has so transformed you by the word of God and the presence of God that you have to tell people, I remember the old Michael, but he ain't showed up in a long time. That's the journey. So the reason many of us are not going on that journey and being transformed is we're listening to too much garbage. So who are you listening to? Because if they're not preaching a transformative word, if you're listening to people who are just beating up on everybody else's sin, if you're listening to people who are always talking about politics, if you're listening to people who only talk about money, then you are stuck because you grow at the level of the revelation you consume. You grow at the level of the revelation you consume. You can't be changed here if you won't let the word change you here. So who are you listening to? This is important. We're living in a day where we've got a thousand voices saying a thousand things. And sometimes we don't realize because we open our ears to all of these opinions you've actually slowed down your spirit because you move at the speed of the revelation you consume. Ah. So come on, we're working together. Look at somebody and say, who are you listening to? <laughs> now, I'm thankful, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that you're listening here tonight. <laughs> Let me say that as I'm going after this. I'm thankful that you're here. I'm thankful that you joined us and you're listening. 
And there are so many other voices in the world who are teaching revelation and truth, and I salute them. All over the world, those who are digging into the gospel, those who are teaching the word, those who are raising us up into life and godliness. And each one of you, you're on your journey, you're growing. You wouldn't be here if you weren't digging into the word and growing. And so I salute you, continue that. But be even more diligent. Why? Because right now in the earth, and this wasn't something I was going to talk about or teach on, but it's part of digging into this. Right now in the earth, there is a deluge of false prophetic. There is a deluge of false prophetic voices that is rising because we've allowed ourselves to have itching ears. And the Bible says itching ears means you already wanted to hear something, so you found a prophet that would say what you wanted. That's what an itching ear is. An itching ear means I need prophetic that makes me feel better. So I'm going to find a prophet who's not living right, but they say what I want. The same is true about ministry. We have in our heart now, we search for churches that fit a cliche. Oh, Lord, let me mess up something. You know, either be late or make folk mad, but don't do both. But I guess we'll just do both. We have in this hour, we, it's a cliche that's going on. We have churches that are trying to fit a current need. Now, that's not a church. That's an emergency center. When you go to the hospital because you suddenly broke your toe, cut your hand, was in a car accident, they're dealing with an emergency. But where do you go for daily life? A general practitioner. Okay, so God gives shepherds, and shepherds are supposed to speak to daily life so that your marriage is balanced, so that your life grows, so that you understand how to walk with God, so that you can survive the world around you. Instead of we having shepherds raised up after God's own heart and them speaking to daily life, too many times now what we have are leaders trying to find whatever the issue is of the day and they craft services to speak to the need. And whatever your fear is, whatever your pain is, whatever your trial is, you run to a place that speaks only to that need. So we're good over here until the kids got a certain age. And since this place don't have a kid's ministry, we're not going to be here. But that's where the Lord told you to be. You were good there with your kids until they became teenagers, but this place over here has a better teen ministry. Or you were good there while you were married, but now that you've gone through a divorce or gotten single, I need to go to a church where there's other singles. Come on, think about this. You and I all know we have friends. We have connections who live like this. Depending on their current state of life, they find a house to fit their current trauma. But nowhere in Scripture does God tell you to connect to a church. He tells you to connect to a pastor. Oh, I told you, I'm causing trouble up in here. In the Bible, you don't connect to a church. You connect to a person. Because the Bible says that person will have the word for that season for you. So if you're looking for a place that simply ticks the boxes, you will never connect to receive from the oil that's on the leadership. Because what transforms you is not the building. Because the building ain't praying for you at 3 o'clock in the morning. The building ain't calling to check on your kids. The building doesn't show up when you've gone through hell on earth. So you've got to connect where somebody, some people inside of that building desire to see you grow. We'll pray for you when nobody else prays for you. We'll hold you and pray over you when you're going through tragedy. We'll encourage you when the days are hard and we'll stand with you to celebrate your success. It's about people connecting for your growth. So this is the hour where God has to filter our thinking because we've been conditioned to find places that are at ease. Yeah. 
that make us feel good instead of places that help us grow. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of living in a world where everybody thinks they're right and everybody has their own truth and everybody's stuck and nobody's manifesting the kingdom of God and nobody's changing society. These are the days where God is waking up sons and daughters and saying, you can do more. There's more in you. There's greatness inside of you. The Holy Ghost has given you power. Change the place where you live. Change the place where you work. Change the relationships you have because the glory of God is in you that's what he's calling us to do and he wouldn't say you could do it if he didn't give you the power ah you got power on the inside of you you got some glory on the inside of you you got the Holy Ghost on the inside of you you're unstoppable if you believe it oh my God in heaven I'm trying to behave I want to run listen here Woo! It's been a minute since I saw you. I've been doing my workout. I feel like running now. I feel, hey, okay, okay. Let's behave. Y'all making me be unseemly now. Okay. So let's go back to scripture. To all of you watching, it's the people in the room. I woke up very calm. And I was going to behave, but it's their problem. Okay. The Bible says, <laughs> the Bible says in John 8:31. I told you to turn to Acts 2.42, so let's throw that out there. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread and prayer. So as I'm talking about growing, as we're growing and becoming more mature, as we're becoming more like Christ, then we have to understand how did they get there. So how they grew was continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Now, you notice these two things are connected, teaching and fellowship, teaching and fellowship. Why is this so important? Because many times we're receiving teaching, but there's, from the teaching we're getting, there's no fellowship, there's no connecting. So part of the way the Word of God is designed is that you're supposed to have fellowship or daily life, the ability to grow in the place where you're receiving the apostles' teaching, the doctrine. Why? Because I can only see it work. I only know this gospel is working. I only know the truth is working when I see others also growing with me. Oh, that, that right there has to sit. Because for some of us, and we've all been there. I've been in churches. I've been in places. I've been in groups where I looked around and said, Lord, Nobody's growing. And that's when the Lord said to me, so why are you eating here? If nobody's growing, why are you eating here? I went, oh. See, the proof of the word is growth. Woo! We're going to have some quiet moments tonight. The proof of a prophetic anointing is not that you got a prophecy. The proof is that the prophecy comes to pass. So all these prophetic voices that we're listening to, do their words come to pass? Or do you keep listening to them because they hype up the atmosphere? Because wearing a shiny jacket and spitting in a circle don't do nothing for me. <laughs> Running through the room and telling everybody their name don't do nothing for me. I knew my name when I got here. So you telling me the Lord told you my name does not impress me. I know he knows my name. He heard my daddy give it to me. Hello. What I don't know is how to get out of this trouble I'm in. What I don't know is how deeply he loves me. What I don't know is am I supposed to stay on this job or go to another job? I need a prophetic word that helps me step into my future, not reveal my now. So if the prophetic anointing that impresses you only reveals known information, then that prophet is not kingdom. He's not walking in the deep place of God. And nine times out of 10, if that's all they give, it's a familiar spirit. Because a familiar spirit reveals information that's already known because it's familiar with you. God reveals that which you have not yet known so that you can step into it. 
Ah. So who are you listening to? So I remember when the Lord said to me, the prophetic anointing is supposed to pull you into your destiny. The apostolic anointing is supposed to secure you in your future because it builds something. The evangelistic anointing keeps you burning for God because they always create a fire, a hunger, a desire. The teaching anointing causes you to have stability because they dig in one truth until that truth is dug down into you. A pastoral anointing causes there to be a strength in your walk with God. If there is no growth, they are not operating in his anointing because God never lets things stay the same. Ah, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is. Let's try it again. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is. Liberty. So God brings liberty. He brings freedom. That freedom keeps pushing you to growth. In God's presence, there is fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So in God's presence, there is continual growth. Continual growth. When there is no growth, when there is no maturity, when there is no access to the deeper things of God, that means we're becoming stagnant. If you become stagnant long enough, that means you're now dying. Too many of us have seen people walking with God and suddenly they lose their joy, they lose their oil, they lose the presence of God, and we can't figure out what's going on. It's because somewhere in their journey they decide to be stagnant. They decide to stop growing. They decide they didn't want God to touch that area. Whenever God goes after something that he asks from you, whenever he wants part of your heart, whenever he says, let me deal with that, when you don't let him, that part becomes stagnant. The fresh water of the Holy Spirit, the moving of the word of God cannot flow in an area that you cut God off from. And wherever you tell God no long enough, he'll let you have it. And when God says, that's yours, whoo, that's dangerous. Any part of your life where God said, that's yours, since you don't want me to touch it, it will slowly begin to die. It will dry up. The oil of God will not be upon it. The fruitfulness of God cannot explode through it. That is those parts of the life when you think about it, you go, I don't know why it's still like that. Have you let him have it? Why is that problem still there? Did you let him have it? Why can I not get free from that? Did you let him have it? Why is that relationship still broken and bitter? Did you ever give that relationship to him? Why is my marriage still going through? Have you given your marriage to the Lord? Or are you still trying to make your partner listen to you and do it your way? Have you given your future to the Lord? Or are you still making all your own choices and then asking God to bless them? Ah. Because God cannot bless what you make. He will only bless what he gives you. Oh, my, my, my. God says, if you let me lead you, I'll lead you into peace. I'll establish you with favor. I'll cause your enemies to bless you. I'll open doors for you that nobody can shut. I'll take you places you never dreamed of. I'll reach back in your past and shut doors that used to haunt you. I'll deliver you from your old mindset and bring you into peace and glory. But you have to let me lead you. Are you letting him lead you? Is he in charge of your decisions? Or are you still making your own choices and then at the end of the day, oh God, please let this work out. Your choice to let him lead you will determine how well you are led. Your choice to let him lead you will determine how well you are led. I just don't feel like the Lord is leading me. Then you're not following. Oh, my. I discovered something, and I, I know we got to get back to this teaching. Let's get back to this teaching. But I discovered something years ago. Whenever I was in a season where I said, Lord, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what to do next. The Lord said to me, aren't you following me? I said, yes. He said, then stop 
telling me what you don't know and just follow. So what did I do the next morning? I got up, I opened my Bible, I worshiped. And I went through my day saying, Lord, whatever you tell me to do today, I'll do it. Sometimes we've gotten under the shadow of what should my whole life be? What is my calling? What is my destiny? What am I supposed to? Uh-uh. And they were daily, daily in the teaching. There are some days when you don't understand your whole destiny and you don't know what's coming next and what should my children be doing 10 years from now and should we be in another city looking for a, for a house or a home or should I be traveling around the world? Should I be building a company? Should I be reaching out to the people? Should I be going to all the parks? Should I be? And we've got all these big questions because we see needs and needs create questions. But even when all of this you don't understand, Pull back, take a breath. Lord, I'll trust you to give me the answer when I need the answer. So until you speak, let me get back in the Word daily in the apostles' teaching. Let me stay in fellowship with people I can trust. And in the company of the saints, I'll feel accepted. I'll find my identity. Stay in the Word, stay in fellowship. Those two things lock you into a place of stability. And then breaking bread and prayer. Breaking bread. We know what breaking bread is. What is breaking bread? Communion. Now, it's more than that. When is the last time, and in this room, I know this is a loaded question that everybody's going to say, it's probably this week sometime. Okay, great. When is the last time that you took the time to have a cup of coffee, a sandwich, a meal with other believers, and you didn't talk about stuff? You just talked about the Lord. Oh, I hope that was sometime this week. Because don't let a week go by that you don't break bread with another believer. It changes your outlook. Because you've been eating with those people on your job, and you know they crazy. You know they crazy. You know every time you're walking into work, you're like, oh, I'm not even Catholic, but Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, these people. Come on, you know, be honest. I know you sit with your family and talk about the Lord, but you know half the time when they're telling you all this stuff about the Lord, you're looking at them going, I can't even listen to you. You ain't taking out the trash. You didn't clean your room, and you want to tell me what the Lord said? Oh, shut up. So sometimes you need to be connecting with people from your kingdom community, from the church you may be going to, friendships God has given you, and just have a cup of coffee and say, can we just talk about the goodness of God? Because I need to reframe my mind right now. I need to reframe my world. I need to sit and discuss God's goodness, his plan, his word. Why? Because too much from the world has been in my ears this week. Can we take 30 minutes and just drink our coffee and celebrate his goodness. If you practice that, find one or two friends that you can meet with and break bread regularly and don't gossip about people and don't complain about the world and don't talk about politics and don't bring up all of the spiritual stuff you've discovered in all of these places. Just talk about God. A meal once a week where you celebrate his goodness and his character will reset your mind. It'll keep you at peace. It'll keep you in victory. It'll keep you in joy. Is that making sense? Okay. So because they were daily together getting into the word, they were daily being changed. So change is what we're after. The kingdom of God is about transformation. Transformation. So it's not just about power and gifts, it's about transformation. So we recognize that we've been walking with God as we can look back over our lives. So how many of you, and I think it's all of you, can say you're different than a year ago in your walk with God? Excellent. See, that's growth, that's change. Now, how many of you can truly say from the time you got saved until now, you are a completely different person? Thank you, Jesus. If your hands hadn't gone up, my God in heaven. (laughs) (laughs) Let me tell you something. I was in a meeting. Oh, please, I hope they ain't watching. But I was in a meeting. 
this woman of God walks up to me and she says, I just need to tell you something. I said, yes. She said, I've been listening to some of your teachings. And I thought, please don't say you've been listening. Because I was watching some of her behavior and it was terrible, <laughs> terrible, terrible. She was acting crazy toward people and talking crazy to people. And I'm sitting back going, ooh, somebody needs to help her. And as she's coming up to me and she said, I've been listening to your teacher. I thought, oh, no. I share in the blame of your current situation. <laughs> Listen, I don't just speak into everybody's life. And so when she said that, I said, can you sit down for a minute? She says, I said, you've been listening regularly? Oh, yes. I said, then why are you still so mean? I said, I'm not mean to people. I said, and so I feel like I'm part of the problem now. If you've been listening to me and you still mean, I need to know why you still mean. And her husband who's sitting down beside her, he says, oh, thank you. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's one of the best moments I've had in ministry in a long time. I thank God for the healings and deliverances, but that right there, he said, oh, thank you. He said, because she don't believe us. I said, oh, no, you mean, you mean. And she's looking at me and she says, really? Why? She said, I just thought this is how prophets were supposed to be. Now, remember this, you are the culmination of what you listen to. I said, who else are you listening to? She named three other prophets. I said, that's the problem. I said, they are gifted from God, but they're mean. And you picked up their style. But in your heart, Jesus is kind to people. He loves people. He doesn't wound the broken. I said, so you've got to let go of their style. Learn from their gift, but let go of their style because they've taught you to be mean. And Jesus didn't mean. She wrote me after that. It was, I got a message recently in my email, and she just said, I just need to thank you. Because she said, I thought people were leaving our ministry because they didn't want the power of God. I said, no, sister, they didn't want you. I said, because you was mean. You woke up mean. She said, well, since I lost that edge, that hard edge, she said, the people are returning. I said, yeah. People want what God has given you, but they may not want your delivery. Check your delivery. Do you say it like Jesus? Do you give it like Jesus? Or are you still doing what your favorite person showed you to do? Because if the delivery doesn't look like Christ, they're not going to listen or follow or give you permission. It's got to be like Jesus. That's why spending time in community is so important. In community, we reflect the face of Jesus to each other. Do people see the face of Jesus in you? I hope they do. Do they see Christ revealed? Do they behold his goodness and his kindness? Do they hear his words through your words? Or do you have to remind them you're a Christian after you act silly? Do they see Jesus in you? Or do they only know you're a Christian because you keep telling them? I was sitting on the plane, flying back here. This young man is beside me. And I had been traveling and preaching so much. The plane is where I sleep. I sleep really well on the plane. I remember the stewardess said to me one time, she said, I, I thought you had died. Literally, I was sleeping so good. They were hitting me trying to wake me up because the young man, he needed to step over me. I said, no, it's called sleep. She said, well, you were sleeping so deeply. I said, that's because I live clean. <laughs> you know how good you can sleep if you hadn't done anybody wrong? You know how good your rest is when you're not afraid that somebody is going to discover something about you? The Bible says you will sleep in peace and wake up in joy. Ooh, Lord, have mercy. I sleep like I've been wrapped in biscuits. <laughs> I mean, people talk about I was wrapped in a blanket. No, no, I sleep like I'm wrapped in biscuits. 
Like I'm gonna wake up and there's gonna be a biscuit right here. I'm like, Lord, you remembered me, didn't you? <laughs> Got a biscuit waiting for me. I celebrate you. Now, so I wake up, this young man is right here and, and when he walks back from the bathroom, he sits down, he says, you just, you just seem like you got so much joy. And so we start talking. I said, I do. We talk a little more and he says, well, what do you do? And I never tell people when I'm on a plane that I'm a preacher. I don't. I never tell them I'm a preacher. I never say I, I move in the prophetic. I just say, I get to help people. Why? Number one, because if you don't know God, I want to at least have the opportunity to have a conversation before you shut me down. And if you do know God, I don't want to have a whole conversation about God just because now you feel obligated to be spiritual. I've been stuck on planes where somebody decided to tell me everything they knew about God, and then when we landed and I met their family, I said, oh, you lied. You was lying. <laughs> Because if you really lived all that stuff you told me on that plane, this wouldn't be happening in the parking lot. <coughs> so I'm talking to the young man. We're talking about helping people, and we're talking about the goodness of life. And I said to him, that's because life is good because God is good. So he looks at me and he smiles. We're now landed. We're both getting our luggage right here in Palm Springs Airport, and I'm about to walk out and go find my car and drive home. And he goes, wait, I know you're a Christian. Yeah. You must be a preacher. I am. He said, oh. I said, well, I tell you what, we've had this great conversation. Here's my information. If you need anything while you're here visiting family, find me. I will take your whole family out for a meal. And I will sit and talk to you about the Lord. His eyes begin to well up, and he says, really? I said, oh, yes. He said, I've been struggling. I've had the worst year of my life. I don't know what to do, and I've been struggling. And he looks at me and says, and I had asked God, can somebody just? I said, well, the Lord answered you, son. I said, now, here's why I'm touching this. I didn't start out by giving him a scripture. I didn't start out by saying, I'm here because the Lord wants to bless you. I didn't turn to him and said, I am a prophet of the Lord. Behold, that. <laughs> we talked about life. And in the midst of talking about life, he kept saying, there's some peace on you. Why have you got so much joy? And the end of the conversation, he goes, you got to know God. Why? Because nobody has that much joy and peace unless they know the Lord. Your life should speak for him before you tell everybody he's in your life. Does your life speak for him? Do we see Jesus in you? Does he have permission to love through you? Does he have permission to be seen through you? God has so filled you with him that if you let him out, you would have people chasing you to learn more about him. Let him out. That's what transformation is about. That less of you is seen, more of him rises. Less of your opinions, more of his glory. Less of your anger, more of his peace. Less of your words, more of his solutions. And if you begin to let him rise through you more and more, you don't have to convince the world about him. They see the change. And the change invites them to meet him. Do they get to see the change in you? I believe they do. I believe that's why you're here. I believe that's why we're growing together. As people see the change, then they follow you to know him. If you're only inviting people because you have a word to give them, they're not going to trust you after a while. Because if you don't look like what you're teaching, that's called hypocrisy. Do you look like what you're saying? Do you look like what you believe? That's what we're going after. Oh, my goodness, my goodness. I could just teach on that for... And the Bible says something amazing. Let's go to this, uh, Colossians 4 and 2. 
We're talking about being transformed, walking in the image and likeness of Jesus. Colossians 4 and 2 says something amazing. Devoting yourselves to prayer and keeping yourselves alert with an attitude of thanksgiving. Colossians 4 and 2. Now, this is so good. King James says, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. The English Standard Version, and devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert, keeping alert with an attitude of thanksgiving. I love that. So as we talk about moving in transformation of being changed into the image and likeness of God, the word is so clear. It says devote yourselves to prayer. Now, what does devote mean? Devote means give yourself. Don't just continue, give yourself to prayer. One of the things that brings transformation in your walk with God is giving yourself to prayer. Devote, give, yield, submit to prayer. So in your own walk with the Lord, in your own prayer life, are you giving yourself to prayer? Are you devoted to prayer? Now, what does that mean? Let me talk about what prayer is supposed to be. Prayer is not you just saying words to God. That's talking. Devoting yourself to prayer means I am going into God's presence and having a conversation with God, and I'm waiting till he answers. See, until God answers, it's not a conversation. Prayer is supposed to be a conversation. What many of us have been taught in religion, in, in church, as we've grown, is we've been taught that prayer is whatever you want to say to God, just say it. Because God just wants to hear your heart. That's not true. I, I know. Ooh, we're going to get quiet for a minute. That's not true. God knew what was in your heart. And some of the stuff in your heart, you shouldn't be saying to anybody. Sometimes we got some crazy messed up, mixed up ideas about people, about God, about ourselves. When you pray, we pray based on the word. So prayer is you saying back to God what God has already said. That's why the scripture is so full. That's why when you look at prayers, the prayer of Daniel, the prayer of Joseph, the prayer of Hannah, the prayer of Mary, there are biblical examples of prayer. Abraham's prayer. The reason God puts prayers in Scripture is so that you can recognize that when you approach him and if you pray like they prayed, you can see what they saw. So are you forming your prayer life biblically? Or do you go into prayer to deliver yourself emotionally and all you're doing is talking to God because you think God is your therapist? God is not a therapist. You don't just go to God and for an hour, you've got 60 minutes, just say whatever's on your mind so you can feel better. But that's how we've been taught in church. We've been taught to come together and when we pray, everybody just says whatever's on their heart. That's not prayer. And that's why we're not seeing the miracles and the signs. Prayer is you reminding God According to your word, Lord, your word says this. So we remind you this day of your word. And then now your next line, and I come into agreement that in my life, in my house, in my church, in my family, on my job, what you've spoken shall now come to pass. So when you say that and you declare that to God with faith, now God says, because I found someone on the earth who believes me and they have spoken my word. My word cannot return to me void. So I will now send power, resources, angels. I will send grace and glory. I will cause everything to move according to my word. But until the word is in your mouth, it can't come to pass from his mouth. So God needs agreement in the earth. So he's looking. What is God listening for? The Bible says, Jesus said, when the son of man comes again to the earth, shall he find faith? Jesus is looking for faith. In every believer, he's still looking for faith. Faith is not just that you agree with God. Faith is that you say what God said and agree. Faith doesn't work till you say something. 
Ah, you've got to say something. In this kingdom life, in this biblical life, in this Christian life, everything in the kingdom is voice activated. Everything God has given you is waiting for your voice. Worship doesn't work till you open your mouth. Praise doesn't have power till you release it through your mouth. You do not see prayer working until you say it out loud. There is no biblical pray in your heart. That prayer doesn't work in your heart. It needs a mouth. You have to open your mouth and say something. Worship cannot be internal. It must be external. You have to worship out loud. Praise requires a voice. Cry aloud. Spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. In the midst of trouble and trial, while they're being attacked, they're marching around Jericho silent, but on the last day, shout and the walls come down. Every victory you need in the kingdom is waiting on your voice. So you've got to say what God is saying. So part of this transformative journey you're on as God changes you, as you're abiding in the apostolic doctrine, the word, as you're fellowshipping with each other, it is to produce in you a level of truth that when you do open your mouth in prayer, when you do open your mouth in worship, there's power on your words. So that when you worship, the atmosphere is filled with the glory of God because you as a worshiper, you've got power on your words. You're not just saying hallelujah, but there's some glory in your hallelujah. There's some victory in your praise. You're not just shouting yes because the choir said say yes. You're not saying amen because the preacher said amen, but the amen came up out of your belly. It's got oil on it. It's got some glory on it. You said hallelujah and the room started to shake because angels started to feel the atmosphere. There's a difference difference when there's power in your words and you get power on your words by letting God rest in your belly down on the inside of you Woo, you got victory on the inside of you you got so much power on the inside of you the devil is scared of you you ought to make the devil nervous every morning oh my goodness my goodness I wake up trying to make him nervous Lord have mercy. I, I know we, we, we almost, I, I'm going to have to close in a minute, but listen, listen, listen. <laughs> I enjoy this life in God so much because I discovered something that the more I give myself to him, the more he gives himself to me. And it becomes a rich overflow to where you're just minding your own business and God shows up. You know how good it is to be standing in a restaurant? I know all my stories have food in it, but <laughs> you've been around me enough. You know food's coming up. You might as well prepare yourself. <coughs> and I'm in a restaurant, and I'm trying to just order my food, and we're all having a meal together. And I'm getting up. We're eating a little bit, and I get up, and I'm going to the bathroom. And as I'm heading to the bathroom, this guy is walking behind me to the bathroom, and he says, uh, hey, hey, we can chat after the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And he's following me into the bathroom. I said, what are you doing? He said, I need to tell you. I could hear what y'all were talking about at your table. And you kept talking about how y'all just saw God heal people. Yeah. I need prayer. You need prayer, yeah. And I, I, I couldn't bring it up at the table. He said, I, I, I'm not a Christian, but all my friends, none of them are believers, and, and, and I didn't want to bring it up at the table because I don't know how they're going to react, but can you pray for me right here? I said, sure. So we're standing in the bathroom. <laughs> and I've got his hand, and I'm praying, may the Lord God Almighty bless you, and we rebuke this sickness, and he's doing this, and he said, what's going on? I said, that's the Holy Ghost. He said, I didn't know this was supposed to happen. I said, shut up, just receive. I said, this is what you get for a bathroom prayer. I said, we in the bathroom, you want me to pray? I'm going to pray like I want to pray. Jesus bless him, and he's doing this. I said, now if I'd have prayed for you outside, you'd have got a nice prayer, but you want a bathroom prayer, this is what you're getting. And I finished praying for him. <laughs> I love this life. I love this life in God. And he's shaking and getting touched. And he said, I didn't know it was supposed to feel like this. I've never had this before. And I said, the Lord has touched you. 
you're healed. And he begins to check and he goes, oh, yeah, the pain is gone. And I said, excellent. I said, when you go back to the table, tell your friends what happened. He said, I will, I will. I said, God met you. And he says to me, I didn't know how you were going to respond. I, I, I didn't know. I've never gone up. I said, don't worry about it. God will show up anywhere. But God can't show up anywhere if you don't let him. What would have happened if I was just having an off day, a bad day? If I just decided that as I turn around and this young man is following me, if I'd have said to him, hey, dude, what you doing? What would have happened if I had decided to be embarrassed because now we're standing in the bathroom and I got this dude's hand and I'm going, hey, receive in the name of Jesus. Too many times the Lord says, I am already with you. And I can do miracles here. I can do healing here. I can manifest my glory here. If you would get out of my way. Your reputation really isn't that important. You don't matter as much to the world as you think you do. But you do matter to God. So why do you shut down God so you can impress the world? when you should be shutting down the world so you can release God. He's there if you let him, if you let him. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert, keeping alert with an attitude of thanksgiving. So this last part, in this time of transformation where God is changing us, that's what I want you to hold on to, with an attitude of thanksgiving. In the world that we're in now, right now, as politics are getting louder and the news is reporting every negative thing you can see and everybody's worried about everything, and it seems like I was listening to some of the polling. I love polls and studying statistics. I was looking at some of the polls and listening to some of the numbers recently that have come out, and right now, depression is the highest in our nation that it's been in a very long time. And the reason it's the highest is because right now they call it a... Um, what they say? It's a flood of loneliness. That more people feel lonely than have ever felt lonely. And I believe that. They were talking to high school students and then they talked to adults. And more high school students say they feel absolutely isolated than they ever have before. And so it's increasing the rate of depression. It's increasing the rate of self-harm. More people say they feel isolated or cut off because of the economic situation and what's going on with politics, and they attribute it to because everything on TV has become negative again. In this hour where you're being inundated by negative, contentious voices, you must keep yourself in an attitude of thanksgiving. Thankfulness will keep you free from that spirit of depression. Thanksgiving will keep you from feeling like you need to be bitter. Thanksgiving will keep your heart alive and flowing and free. Thanksgiving, but Thanksgiving is a choice you have to make because there are days when it feels like you have nothing to be thankful for. And that's when you have to stop, breathe, and look around you. There's something to be thankful for. When you can't be thankful for the job, be thankful for your family. Be thankful for life. You're awake, you're breathing, your mind is working. You had two legs to bring you in here. You might have some pain in your body, but at least you can move. Other folks are in wheelchairs right now and can't get up. You may not have all the money to pay all your bills, but my God, you got enough that you ate today. Be thankful for the thing that you can be thankful for. Don't get stuck in the cycle of worry and fear and looking ahead to all the decisions you have to make. Be thankful. Be thankful. Every place you can be thankful, be thankful. And when you're thankful, then remind God, and I thank you for giving this to me. Oh, do you know how much you can be? In Scripture, there are 367 verses about thankfulness and celebration. 367. That means you have a scripture for every day 
and two left over. <laughs> so you could literally find a scripture every day just to be thankful for something. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord and rejoice in him. Rejoice this day the Lord has blessed you. Rejoice, O Israel. Scripture after scripture that just says rejoice. Be thankful. Rejoice. What could your world look like if you changed your perception of it? I remember a story from uh, my great aunt. And she said she was going through a bad season. They didn't have much money and uh, she had five kids. And she said, I've got five kids to cook for, a husband who's coming home, and we had no food in the house. And so she called our great-grandmother, who we all called Mammy. She called her, and uh, Mammy said, how you doing today? She said, oh, I don't have nothing in my house to cook, and I've got to cook for all these kids, and I've been working all day, and oh, Lord. And so Mammy asked her and said, you got any flour in your house? Yes, ma'am. All right. You got any salt? Yes, ma'am. Okay. You, you got a couple of eggs? Yes, ma'am, I do. Hmm. She said, you got any oil or butter? I got a little bit. Okay. Baby, it sounds like you got something in your house. It may not be what you want, but you got something. So if you don't do anything else, you got enough to make pancakes in the morning. You can make biscuits in the afternoon. You got flour, you got oil, you got... She said, well, yes, ma'am. She said, then all you need is just one piece of meat to add to it, and you just got a meal. And she said she began to weep because perception was different from a woman who was always thankful and a woman who was complaining. I may not have what I want, but I've got what I need. Let me work with what I have until God gives me more. Let me work with what I have until God gives me more. What could your world look like if you just started being thankful? Lord, I don't like what's going on. Oh, but God is with you. You're going to survive it. You've been through worse before. You've survived worse in the past. You know if you look back over your life and think about your worst days, this ain't so bad. If you think about the stuff he delivered you from, the houses he brought you out of, the people he delivered you from, you've already survived worse. So why are you worried now? After everything God has done for you, why are you worried now? He's already done greater for you. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Lift up your head, all ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Who is the king of glory? The Lord mighty in battle. You've got to remind yourself, lift up your head. David said, I will lift my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Lift up your head. Lift up your head, O ye gates. Mm. There's a great verse that says, and why do you weep, O Israel? Is there not a king in you? Oh, you've got a king living inside of you. You've got the kingdom dwelling in you. Why are you worried? Why are you brokenhearted? Why are you overcome? There is a king in you. You've just got to remember. Look at somebody and say, the king is in me. Okay, you said it. Now say it like you mean it. The king is in me. Yes. If the king is in you, that means the kingdom is in you. That means his resources are there. His power is there. His presence is there. His victory is there. You cannot lose because the kingdom is in you. Oh, my, 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 my. And if you start to meditate on that and think about it long enough, whoo, good God from Zion. Oh, my, my, my. If you don't know any Holy Ghost words, good God and Miss Molly, find something. Just shaka maka Zulu, make up your own words. <laughs> kind of church I came from, me tie my bow tie, me drive a Mahonda. You find something. <laughs> but find a reason to rejoice. 
The Lord is on your side. God is fighting your battles. He's conquered your enemies. He put the devil underneath his feet. He's given you victory. You got more power than you believe. You've got access to heaven. The Father is listening to your prayers. Jesus has given you his power. The Holy Ghost is inside of you. There's an army of angels following you and fighting for you. My God, if you think about what he's given you, you cannot lose if you believe it. If you believe it, you have to believe. You have to believe. I remember, I'll tell you one more story, then, then we'll pray and dismiss. I remember being on the freeway. Oh, this is good. And I'm driving along, and I'm minding my own business, as I'm apt to do. And as I'm in the car, and I've got worship turned all the way up, the worship was loud enough that, you know, you got to turn that bass up until you can feel it in the door. <laughs> Come on, who know what I'm talking about? Come on, okay, if you're going to play the song, play the song. So I'm playing the song and I'm worshiping and I'm rocking out while I'm driving and, and, and the door was just boom, 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 boom. Look, look at here. I need that car to act like it's got a heartbeat. I want that bass all the way. I want the rims to be like, yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm driving and singing and praising God. And all of a sudden as I'm driving, I hear a horn go off. And I look. And there's a tractor trailer coming across. He's lost control. And he takes out a car beside me. I'll never forget this. And at the moment when this thing should have taken me right off the road, in the midst of all this praise, I remember all I shouted out was, Jesus! When I said Jesus, it's like an invisible wall came between me and the tractor trailer. And it keeps... And I'm going, and it's going. But now, instead of sliding sideways, it's just sliding forwards. And as I'm looking <laughs> and driving, and I'm still going, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. My car makes it past the 18-wheeler, and then shoo, it takes out that lane. And as I got past it, I said, Lord, Lord, whoo, Lord, the devil almost. He said, there was no almost. He said, I was with you in the praise. I was with you in the prayer. Do you think I was going to leave you in the trouble? Woo! Change your perspective. If I was with you in the worship, if I was with you in the prayer, why do you think I left you in the trouble? Daniel said, I've been praying to him three times a day. Put me in the lion's den. Hey, if God don't deliver me, I'm going to heaven, but I think you're going to see a miracle today. The three Hebrew boys, throw us in the fire. We will not change our confession about God. If he was with us in the prayer, if he was with us in the worship, he's going to be with me in the fire. Change your perspective. <laughs> Devote yourself, give yourself to his presence, and then watch him work. Watch him work. I've been on two planes that almost went down, almost, almost. And both times I remember, one time I saw the angel of the Lord outside. They were shooting at the plane. We had bullet holes when we landed, but we lost no cabin pressure. The other time in the middle of a hurricane, we dropped thousands of feet. People went up in the air and came down. Air mass dropped. And as we can see the waves, because the plane is flying sideways because the wind shear hit us and we couldn't get the plane straight. Or they couldn't, I wasn't flying. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm in the seat, and, uh, and y'all remember this story? And the woman of God who's supposed to be my prayer leader on that journey, she's screaming. <laughs> and she ain't screaming Jesus, she's screaming, we're going to die, we're going to die. What kind of faith does that give you? When the head intercessor, we gonna die, we gonna die. And she was in the window, I'm in the aisle, and we've got this young man who they had put in between us, and he was not part of our team. 
So she had grabbed his arm, her fingernails going into his arm. He's a non-believer. We're over in the Philippines, and she's screaming, we're going to die, we're going to die. And I, I leaned forward. I said, shut up. <laughs> shut your mouth. You're going to get us killed. <laughs> your confession is going to kill us. Shut up. <laughs> I can laugh now. We wasn't laughing then. And I'm yelling at her to shut up, and she looks at me. She says, man of God. I said, shut up. <laughs> and the young man who she's holding on to his arm, he's just looking at her and looking at me. And he's like, why are they screaming at each other? We all going to die. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I said, Lord, I thank you. When I said that lightning hit as it flashed, I'm looking out the window and I can see we had dropped so low we could see the water. We're looking at waves. The wave comes up. And then I look, and at the end of the wing, there's an angel standing. I said, Lord, he said, I've sent the angel. He shall right the plane. And I watched the angel grab the wing, and all of a sudden, the plane started to level out. As the plane levels out, the angel stayed by the wing, and I'm watching him hold the wing. And I'm watching the angel. He's looking through the storm. His wings are stretched out and they're as long as the, as the wing of the plane. And he's holding the plane. And I'm looking at the angel, and every time the lightning would flash, I could see the angel. And I'm going, I ain't never seen nothing like you. <laughs> you know what goes through your mind? And all I'm thinking is, God, I thank you. Yes. And the angel's holding the plane, and the wind is still as strong, and we're in the middle of the storm, and all of a sudden, I see the angel do this. He just pushed us, and we went right through the storm. The angel disappears. We come through the storm. We land. Now, when I say come through the storm, we come through the worst part. It's still raining. It's still. We land in Dipperlock City. When we land in Dipperlock City, everybody is getting their stuff, and the pilot comes out. And the pilot says, you've heard this. The pilot says, I don't know whose God helped us. He said, but we should have gone down into the waves. He said, we lost complete control. He said, y'all didn't realize, he said, but the plane was out of control. And everybody went, oh, no, we knew. <laughs> and when he said, I don't know whose God answered, I lifted my hand. I said, it was mine. That was my God. That was my God. And they looked at me. I said, y'all's gods don't answer. That was my God. Because if y'all's gods had answered, you would have been calling on your God. Think about that. The only voice I heard, besides there was another lady in the back, the only voice I heard crying out when I said, Lord Jesus, I heard nobody else call on their God. You know whether or not your God can handle the storm. Now, I don't care what people say about the Lord, and I don't care how much they want to fight with you about God and talk about your faith. They know that whatever they believe can't handle a storm. But we've got a promise from God Almighty that if we would walk with him and let him begin to transform our heart, oh, he's still the God that can make a storm be silent. He still walks on water and speaks to lightning. <laughs> he still holds the hurricane in his hand and makes the tornado sit down beneath his foot. God is still God, and he's your God. And you've got to begin to act like he's your God. Talk to the storms. Speak to the things that made you worried. Speak his name in the midst of the problem and watch him work. He's a mighty God. He's an awesome God. He's your God. And he's waiting for you to say something. He's changed your heart. Now let him out of your voice and then watch him work and he will do great and mighty things. Have you been blessed tonight? Yes. Father, we thank you in this place and for those watching, we thank you for your word and we ask you that you will keep us in the place of change. Keep changing us. Keep working on our hearts. Keep transforming us. Love us enough to not let us stay the same. Take us from glory to glory and faith to faith. 
and we thank you. And now I pray the blessing of the Lord over everyone in this place and everyone that's watching. I pray the Lord would bless you and keep you, that he would shine his face upon you, that he'd cover you in mercy, that he would visit your families, that he would cause your children to know him, your marriages to prosper, your businesses to increase, and the wisdom of God to be present in your mind and in your heart. The Lord do great and mighty things for you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. To those here and those watching, please keep us in prayer. Where are we going this weekend? Vacaville. Vacaville. So those that know us up in Vacaville in the Sacramento area, we invite you to meet us at the Mission Church, the Mission Church, Saturday, Saturday 6 o'clock and Sunday. We'll see you there. Last time we were there, God did some amazing miracles. So see you there. Bless you.